And so what's happening now is legitimate Redditors are going, you know, they have a great experience with LSAT Demon. They want to go post their experience on r slash LSAT. They post it and <laughs> it gives them the impression that they are posting about LSAT Demon and then just no other user ever sees it. So it's like this secret shadowy thing. Hello and welcome to episode 445 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. I'm Nathan Fox and with me is Ben Olson. We're the co-founders of LSATdemon.com and the LSAT Demon Daily podcast. You can be LSAT famous by sharing news or asking questions on our website, thinkinglsat.com. We have a free class coming up. We hope you all will join. It's one of our most popular teachers by far. Uh, Chris is teaching a class on March 18th, 4.30 Pacific, 7.30 Eastern. Uh, the class is called The Final Passage. It's a high-level reading comprehension class. Everybody loves it. Everybody loves Chris. Please sign up for that class, lsatdemon.com forward slash free to sign up. We're going to start with a plea for some help and advice from our audience. We have this weird thing going on on Reddit that we just don't understand. We've been trying to figure it out for like a year internally, and finally, we're just going to ask you guys for help. But it looks like positive comments about the demon are being deleted and even shadow banned. I didn't know what a shadow ban was before we started talking about this stuff. But Ben, why don't you uh, talk about this a little bit? Because right now, apparently people are not allowed to say nice things about LSAT demon on r slash LSAT. Yeah, so we're going to talk about Reddit today. Reddit is not a site that I go to very often. Um, but I think this was two years ago. Boy, when you tell stories from your memory, the timeline can get really messed up. But I think about two years ago, people were commenting about the demon on Reddit. This is, I'm talking specifically about the R LSAT subreddit. People would chime in and say things like demon, demon, demon. Like they were just so enthusiastic about the demon that the moderator of that subred said, who is Graham Blake. We've had him on the show before. He said, hey, this is weird. This doesn't seem legitimate to me. So I think he started digging into these comments and trying to figure out who these people were. And he reached out to us. He texted me. He called me, I think, or maybe I called him back. And we were talking on the phone. And he was explaining what was going on. And I was like, hey, I have no idea what you're talking about. <laughs> We don't ask people to comment on other people's comments. I'm hardly ever on Reddit. I, th I definitely have an account, but I think I've maybe made three posts in my entire existence, maybe six. Who knows? And uh, in this whole process, he identified two demon team members who had been posting things without acknowledging that they worked for us. They immediately apologized and said, oh, sorry, we didn't... <laughs> It didn't seem to me that they had any negative intentions. And these were not the posts that, that <laughs> Graham was actually concerned about. There was other posts. Right. So th th these things like kind of got mixed together. And even the people who did work for us, they had been on r slash LSAT or, you know, like considered, you know, they, they just thought, oh, I'm a normal person. I'm going, I'm doing my normal life. And yeah, hey, you guys should really check out LSAT Demon because it's great. And I happen to work there. They didn't mention that part, but it's like, they thought that they were just sharing information to a community that they were part of. And yeah, and <laughs> it really seemed to me like that they saw themselves more as Reddit users. Right. Than exactly. demon. <laughs> I mean, they were working part time doing teaching a couple classes, but they said, hey, our bad will acknowledge that we're from LSAT demon going forward. And we made that a policy here. Right. We anyone who joined us, we said, look. You've got to tell people that you work for LSAT Demon when you comment on Reddit. We immediately made that clear to everybody. And also, to, to be clear, the, the vast majority of the posts that were on Reddit about LSAT Demon at that time were totally a thousand percent legit and had no connection to us, right? There were like a couple people who worked for us who had yeah. made a couple of posts yeah, but this then, is, these are unrelated. Yeah, no, no. I, I, I am bringing this in because two years ago, Graham was looking at these odd posts in his mind, and then he he encountered these 
two teachers or two team members that he thought should actually have said more about their affiliation with us. And he he merged the two together and basically right. that said, ah, combined with all the great reviews. Yeah. Ah, you must be using bots. And he, he made this <laughs> post called about those demon bots, right? Wow. Which yeah. I don't even know what an Elsa or sorry, what a Reddit bot would be. I'm sure we could figure that out. I'm sure there are people you just start searching and you could get someone to do this for you, but we're just so not involved <laughs> with Reddit and things like that, no. let alone orchestrating some sort of bots or I think he talked about like voting rings or something like that where you get, you know, maybe a few people have right. multiple accounts and they they just go in and there and they try to make it. Anyways, we, I'm sure you we, could like pay, you know, people from Eastern Europe or something to do this sort of thing. I don't think it would be very hard to like get people on the to pay people on the Internet to do exactly what we were accused of doing two years ago, which we did not do two years ago <laughs> or ever. <laughs> and yeah, we've. Yeah. Why does this matter? Well, so anyways, I responded to that. I should probably read the post I posted two years ago uh, again, just to refresh my memory. But I responded to that, said, hey, we're not doing this, but whatever. And we just let it go. I mean, it's not something that's part of our day to day operation, right? I'm not thinking about Reddit. I'm not going on there nope. ever. So it's like it's the Internet. Just let Reddit be Reddit. Right. Like, let it go. Um, it's over. Anyways, I don't know whether it was a year later or months later, but at some point, someone reached out to us and was like, hey, did you know that comments about LSAT Demon are being deleted? And we later learned that this is called shadow banning. So when someone makes a comment about LSAT Demon, I don't know the technicalities behind it. I don't know whether it's automatic or manual, but these comments are being deleted. And what I later learned, or we've learned, is that um, the comments are deleted so people can't see them, but the person who made the comment can. So they're not as likely to realize that their comment has been deleted. Right, we, we had to go like learn what this even looked like from the user perspective, but if you make a positive post about LSAT Demon, Mm -hmm. you'll think, oh, yeah, great. I had a great experience. I'm posting my, you know, hey, I improved my score by X points. I used LSAT Demon. I think it's great. You should try it. It'll appear to you when you log on, it'll appear that that post is there or that comment is there. But from any other user's account, <laughs> that post won't show up. That comment won't show up. Yeah, and I don't know if it's just nice things or negative things. It, it sounds like basically anytime someone comments or posts, no, it's it's nice things. We we have confirmed recently that if you say like middling things about an LSAT demon, it might stay. But oh, interesting. Yeah, or bad <laughs> things will definitely stay. But if you say good things about LSAT demon, it gets banned. Yeah, and it's I guess that's called shadow banning. I had never heard of this before. I wish I didn't know what this even was, but uh, apparently it is a thing that has been happening to us for a while now. And we yeah. have several examples of of those. Yeah. So some people kindly put some examples together for us. And uh, there was some time that we needed to like actually look into this. Wait, are you serious? Are we just getting mixed up here? And people were able to find examples of this happening. And now we're reaching out to everyone to say, hey, it sounds like our people when they comment on us are getting banned or they're not getting banned, but their comments are getting deleted. And we'd like to know what to do. We've reached out to Graham. He hasn't responded. And uh, it's been months, so almost a year at this point, really. Oh, it's been more than that. I mean, your original post was two years ago. Yeah, I guess it was like a year ago that we found out about this secret ban. I mean, the accusation of using bots was two years ago. That's never been retracted even though it is still false. And uh, so we're very, we're very confused. 
it seems like we're getting kind of fucked over. But we want to know from our listeners what to do about it. There doesn't seem much we could do about it because we can't get a hold of Graham and neither of us really use Reddit. So we just don't even know where to go from here. Yep. You can reach us at help at thinking We would love to hear any advice that you might have about this issue. Um, maybe there's just nothing we could do about it and we should just say, fuck it and let the internet be the internet. But it, it does seem like other than this, I mean, who knows what else is going on in that thread or in that uh, sub, I guess they call it r slash LSAT. Who, who knows what other things are going? It just, it seems like it's a place where people go legitimately to get information. Like it's oh, supposedly an open public forum. I think there is some, uh, an air of legitimacy to Reddit in the sense that like, you know, Amazon reviews, you're always questioning like, wait, are these, yeah, totally. are they using bots there? And it's like, totally. oh, well, I'm going to go to Reddit. So to the extent that people rely on Reddit to decide how they're going to prepare or figure out how to tackle the LSAT, it's a little unnerving to think that there's some sort of, I don't know, censorship going on in the background. Yeah. Um, I mean, fake reviews are also unnerving, but I, I don't know oh, how to deal with that either. <laughs> that's absolutely a problem. And I think that there should be moderation. And if anybody is using bots, then they should be banned. But yeah. we're not, we never did use bots. We're not using bots. And so what's happening now is legitimate Redditors are going, you know, they have a great experience with LSAT Demon. They want to go post their experience on r slash LSAT. They post it and... <laughs> Worse than just it's like, sorry, you can't post about LSAT Demon. It it gives them the impression that they are posting about LSAT Demon. Yeah. And then just no other user ever sees it. So it's like I, this I, secret I, shadowy thing. Yeah. That's the, the thing the, that's really fucked up about this. Yeah. If it was open, like, hey, we're censoring this. And it's like, okay, well, at least you're owning it. And then there can be some discussion about that. But it's it's hidden. The other part that I didn't realize, I didn't realize that it was just on positive reviews. Apparently so. Yeah, we have kind of we have that's odd. like I assumed it was just like everything like a blanket, like, auto. like automatic. Yeah, no, it it appears as if like someone is actually going through and looking and and yeah, it, it appears to be more like there's a human doing it. There's there's a little more thought behind it. Interesting. Mm -hmm. OK. Yeah. Okay. But well, anyway, anyways, yeah, help us yeah. out. <laughs> <laughs> well, and confirm or deny whether this is even happening, right? Like we want our listeners to go find out if is this happening. And please don't yeah. be a dick and just start posting a bunch of wild shit on Reddit that you don't really understand. Just go find out and tell us what we should be doing if anything. Um I mean, of course, yeah, you can be do respectful. You... I mean, I, who knows what's going on, but we'd like to to learn more. We would like, we would love to learn more. We have a post on our website, go to lsat.link forward slash Reddit, and you can see our post. It links to the original weird po post about bots and it, and it links to Ben's response, which was immediate and thorough and very apologetic to the extent that our employees had, had made a couple of posts without acknowledging that they were employees. Um, you know, we never instructed them to do that. They were just students who had become employees and then had a good experience with LSAT demon and posted nice things. Ben acknowledges that, apologizes for that, and talks about our new policy that we have sent, you know, henceforth told everybody who ever works here, do not post on Reddit without acknowledging that you work here. But that isn't even that, you know, and then with all of that, no response from Graham. And then he basically just shut down and won't even talk to us at all. But we continue to have this uh, banning happening. So I don't know. What do we do? Go, go read our post again, lsat.link forward slash Reddit, and then contact us if you can uh, help at thinkinglsat.com. Thank you. Yeah. All right. LSAC is making some changes, Ben, to LSAT writing. Okay. Wow. This is a long, long email from Every LSAC. email from them is very, very long. Yes. It's interesting. TLDR so you know about <laughs> LSAT writing. <laughs> yeah, basically, uh, they're going to change the format so that the writing prompt is a little more, I don't know, it sounded to me like real world. <laughs> they have declared that it is going to debut on July 31. 
I'm not mm-hmm. sure that it's any more real world than the existing LSAT writing. The the new LSAT writing test takers will be presented with a debatable issue along with different perspectives that provide additional context. These perspectives, each of which is conveyed in a few sentences, are representative of a system of beliefs or values. Together, the perspectives illustrate competing ideologies and arguments around a particular issue. The test taker will then draft an argumentative essay in which they take a position while addressing some of the arguments and ideas presented by the other perspectives. So, okay, is that a little bit more real world? I I guess so. Um, Seems like a kind of a superficial way, but... (laughs) Well, there has to be some sort of uh, standardization here, right? But I felt like before you had these two choices and you had the the facts for both sides of those two choices and it, it felt like you had to be pretty constrained whereas in the real world right you have multiple voices multiple options sure seems like they're trying to expand that a little bit okay and so there is going to be additional reading required they're going to add a 15 minute pre-writing analysis period to the LSAT writing in okay. which test takers can organize their thoughts using guided pre-writing analysis questions Oh, wow. So it's actually going to even feed you the kinds of things that you should be thinking about. Oh, and then they're going to have you take notes using the digital note taking tool provided in the testing environment. I'm a little cringy about that because it sounds like they're probably not going to let you use pencil and paper to take your notes during this portion of the LSAT writing. You're going to have to use a digital note-taking tool. And then my bet is that you're not going to be able to copy and paste from that digital note-taking tool into the real thing. Because otherwise, Mm. it's just part of your writing time. Mm. Anyway, most test takers will have a total of 50 minutes. That's 15 minutes for pre-writing analysis and note-taking, and then 35 minutes to uh, do the actual writing. Of course, if you have accommodations for additional time or whatever else, you'll still have all of those accommodations. It's going to launch on um, July 31st. They declared a specific date that that's ha- it's happening on July 31st. Uh, there is a sample of the new LSAT writing prompt on LSAC.org. It's text only. It doesn't have the functionality, timer, digital note-taking tool, mm. uh, none of that stuff. Oh, but it is that is included in the practice environment in Law Hub. So uh, mm. wait, So is there all that already exists? Interesting. Hmm. I don't know. What do you think? I was expecting them to talk about grading. They did. And they said it's going to remain unscored, right? But these other tests have figured out ways to grade writing. I was surprised that they haven't done that. Yeah. No, but they are in the Mm. one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. Tenth paragraph where they say it will remain unscored for 2024-25. They say over the course of 2024-2025 testing cycle, we will be analyzing data on the new LSAT writing prompt to assess its validity and reliability with a long-term goal of providing a scored LSAT writing assessment that schools may use in their holistic admission processes. Yeah, wow. So that's a long-term goal. It's not happening during the 2024, 2025 cycle. Probably nobody listening to this is going to ever do a scored version of LSAT writing, but uh, it seems like that is on the horizon somewhere. Okay. Well, if it becomes scored, I guess we'll have to start talking about it. Yeah, we'll have to talk about it a lot. I mean, we already talk about LSAT writing in our, um, in the demon, we've got all kinds of resources about LSAT writing. It's never something that we think that you should spend a whole lot of time prepping for, though, because as Ben says, it's not scored. Um, also, I don't know that. Like, we just probably don't have that much to say about it. You know, I can't make you immediately become a better writer. Mm-hmm. That That's real difficult. I mean, I, I could give you some tips <laughs> like I'll give you one tip. This is the best tip I probably have to offer about writing. Use shorter sentences, please. Just use shorter sentences. Use a damn period once in a while. And if you do that, you'll become a better writer. Um, 
<laughs> we have all, we have other tips about how to attack the existing LSAT writing. Uh, mm -hmm. As we get closer to the launch, the July 31st launch of this new LSAT writing, we're going to have to update that to talk about uh, a different rubric for how you're going to deal with these other voices and these other questions that are being asked. Cool. Yeah, cool. So that's the news from LSAC. We got an email here from Anonymous. Why don't you read it? Hello. As I'm listening to your episode from this week on February 26, 2024, you talk a lot about being a gladiator of the English language. Hmm. What are some small steps one can take in their LSAT prep every day to become a gladiator of the English language and or big steps slash strategies to do so? Uh, I got two for you right off the bat. One is you got to just read more. It's, I mean, doing LSAT prep is a good step in that direction because reading on the LSAT is, you know, it's what it's all about, really. It's always a reading comprehension test first. You can't answer the questions if you can't comprehend what they're saying and what they're asking. So, you know, you've got to comprehend the passage. You got to comprehend the question. You got to comprehend the answer choices. You got to comprehend the wrong answer choices enough to know that they're wrong. You don't have to fully comprehend them because they don't even really have to make sense, right? Mm -hmm. But the right answer, you have to comprehend it for what it says and you have to understand how it answers the question. So yeah. LSAT prep is a lot of reading and the more you read, the better you're going to get. I would also recommend that people read books. I think that you need to get into fiction, nonfiction. I don't really care. Anything that you like, anything that's going to keep you reading. Um, for me, it was falling in love with, well, shit, I read a lot as a little kid. I mean, I just was, the library was the best place in the world. Hmm. Walk in empty handed and walk out with a stack of books. <laughs> best yeah. thing ever, you yeah. know, for free. It's amazing. Yeah. And the library has gotten better and better. I happened to walk into a library yesterday um, with my sister and her niece in the small town that I'm from. And it was amazing the shit that you could do there. You can check out a Chromebook with hmm. a internet hotspot and all the charging cables and just leave with it. <laughs> just go sit down in a anywhere that you have power, I guess, wow. and log on to the internet using this Chromebook. It's like incredible. And it's, t it's totally free. Um, there were activity kits for parents, like here's a little craft activity, like it's books and crafts and stuff and just check it out, walk right out. Um, that's wild. Yeah. Libraries are amazing. Uh, I was there to get another library card to add to my portfolio of libraries that I borrow electronic, electronically from in Libby. Mm -hmm. But anyway, people should try to fall in love with reading. The more you read, the better you're going to get at this stuff. And then the last one is look up words. And I'm amazed at how often I look up words. We, we started talking about it on this podcast, what, like a year ago or a couple of years ago, we started talking about looking up words and I, I'm, I, I can't, I can't stop. I mean, I, I look up words, I, I, I'm looking up words like every single page now hmm. because I can't, because just to see how the word is used in a semi surprising way and I'm paying enough attention to it that I'm like, Oh, I, huh. That's an interesting word choice. Let me look yeah. up that word. And it's like the third definition. You're like, Holy smokes. Yep. <laughs> no, the, or the first definition. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Yes, We've been, we learned the second or third. Yeah. That's what's wild. Exactly. Yeah. Or we, we learn like a, um, a colloquial use or a, a slang use or, mm -hmm. um, and, and it's not to say that the LSAT uses language in some weird, different way, but it does use language in a literal way, like a, a very literal literary way. Mm -hmm. And um, it's not time yet for word of the week. But yesterday I looked up the word gross. Hmm. Everybody knows what gross means, right? Yeah, yeah. Interesting. No, you don't. You don't know what gross means. I mean, you know what <laughs> you know, like what? what we like if we see like some nasty vomit or something Ew, gross i'm thinking of the right. usage in gross negligence it almost sounds like it means like mm. excessive or something yeah so the i i was reading um fiction an excellent mm. book called left hand of darkness it's a sci-fi it's fucking awesome okay. um but i was reading this sci-fi 
and there was a a a, a large person. He was described as fat, uh, and. He, there was a, a string of other adjectives about his personality and his clothes and, you know, like maybe he was fashionable and he was gregarious and he was gross. And I was like, gross. Yeah. What do you mean? He's gross. Yeah. Cause he's at a fancy dinner and he's very fashionable and he's like the life of the party, but he's gross. And yeah. I looked it up and gross basically means like big. It's like, it means excessively uh, big. Hmm. Um, so that's maybe the same gross in gross negligence, big or negligence. gross weight. Yeah, yeah. I, I was I was really surprised though. I was like, huh, that's so strange. And I just find myself doing that all the time, just yeah. looking up words. Um, mm. So, anything else for uh, anonymous? Do you have any other tips? Yeah. So one thing I was thinking, and I agree with everything you said. You said the three things. What were they? They were uh, study the LSAT, read yeah. more books, and yeah. look up words. Right. Um, I would add to that when you're studying the LSAT, there are so many sentences that the LSAT has taken and they were probably well written when they were originally written by someone else. And they've, they've made them slightly more abstract or long or wordy. And I think it's tempting for people to kind of gloss over them and move on to the next sentence. When you don't fully understand a sentence, look at it as a glorious opportunity to push your abilities further and become a gladiator of the English language because a gladiator doesn't talk or write in the way that the LSAT often talks or writes, but you 100% can translate and understand it. And so force yourself to like go back, break down the sentence. Yeah. Okay, let me read it again until right. it clicks and the light bulb comes on and I can turn to my nephew and tell him what that sentence mm. just said. If I'm understanding you correctly, it's almost like you've got your editor hat on where you're mm. like, because I find myself doing this all the time. I'm reading a reading comprehension passage and it's like I'm struggling to understand it and I work my way through it and I finally feel this comprehension click where I go, oh, so you're just trying to say X, yes. Y, Z. I, I, re I reword it. <laughs> That's exactly the thought though, right? Like, okay, all you're really trying to say here is, yes. and it's usually some simple idea and this mm -hmm. abstraction and pompousness comes from, well, the LSAT I think is trying to make the sentences harder to decode, but, but in academia or whatever, it might just come from insecurity, right? Like you, you want to make the idea sound better or better bigger than it actually is. Yep. And when you decode it, it's like, oh, all you're saying is that most people are nervous. Okay. You said that right. in a really long and wordy way. <laughs> right. And it, I do like, I have a little bit of fun with it when I'm doing it. Cause I, I, I read it and I go, oh yeah. Okay. You could have just said, could have just said it this way, but mm -hmm. by doing that, yeah, I have a little bit of fun with it. And I also am I'm I'm really comprehending the test deeply because I'm not just like, oh, no, I'm going to be fixated on the exact words that they said. Instead, I'm thinking about the meaning of the words that they said and kind of rearranging that a little bit for them and going. Uh, it's a little patronizing. It's a little bit condescending. You know, it's a little bit like, huh, you're going to say yeah. it that way. That okay, way. Well. Yeah. <laughs> and yeah, I mean, sometimes the right answer will be worded in that really weird way. Mm -hmm. Right. People, people commonly say, I don't know what to do when I make a good prediction. I made the same prediction that you did, Nathan. And I just, I get into the, I get into the answer choices and I just, it's not there. And I'm yeah. like, well, but it, it is <laughs> in this case, it, it is, it's right there. Yeah. They're just saying it in some other way. And at the same, similarly, when I'm in the, when I'm in those answer choices, I'll, I'll go, well, I, I can't pick any of these other answers this answer here. Yeah, that's not the way I would have put it, mm -hmm. but I can see how it means the same thing or similar. Mm -hmm. That's got to be the right answer. And it's like, I'm getting out my blue pencil or whatever editors used to use in the old days. And, you know, <laughs> like given, I would have said it a different way, but that's the next answer. That's the right answer. Okay. Let's move on. I have one other tip that I think is definitely near the bottom of the list, but I, I do think it can help people. 
and that is uh, writing a journal. Oh, interesting. Hmm. Even if it's just a paragraph a day, I think people uh, get a lot better at language when they try to force themselves to construct the sentences. To write a little bit. Yeah. yeah. It's good practice too, because uh, LSAT writing is a thing. Uh, we talked about it earlier on the show. It's uh, becoming increasingly important, apparently. It's still not scored, and it doesn't look like it's going to be scored anytime in the next couple of years. Um, but they are making changes, as we talked about earlier in the show, to LSAT writing. That indicates that schools are paying more attention to it now. And um, they can tell a lot by looking at a 35-minute forced writing sample. If they, if they wanted to investigate, they could... They could learn a lot from just a sentence or two. So yeah. getting better at actually writing correct sentences. <laughs> Get Grammarly, uh, yes. you know, maybe for your Get journal. Get that feedback. Right? Yeah, totally. Yeah, because like you the handwritten journal, it. write whatever the fuck you want, or just yeah. writing it in some doc that doesn't have any kind of grammar correction. Yeah. Um, that you're not really learning as much by doing that. But with Grammarly or maybe even Google Docs, you know, it'll tell you if you've got incomplete sentences and stuff, run-ons, et cetera. Yeah. All right. That was a good question. Uh, next up is pearls versus turds. Yeah, this is from Caitlin. The subject is pearls versus turds. Reading comp is not simply a test on how well you read. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, it is. Uh, anyway. Hi, Ben and Nathan. Been listening to you guys for over a year now. I have a pearls versus turds for you. Today I was in the library studying for the LSAT and just for fun, picked up another company's LSAT prep book to see what kind of junk they throw in there. Immediately I flipped to the section on RC and the first line I read was this, quote, if RC were just a test on how well people read, it would be difficult to improve on it. The good news is that RC is very learnable. There are hidden agendas and secret patterns to reading comprehension. By mastering these RC strategies and combining them with timing strategy, you can increase your scores significantly, end quote. Whoa. Is this true? <laughs> ben surprised. Is this true, says Caitlin? Is RC more than just a test on how well people read? Or is it just that? How well you read and nothing more. Looking forward to hearing your input, Caitlin. So Ben, secret strategies, hidden agendas? I hate it. I hate, I, I hate how this all <laughs> begins too. Um, it's yeah. like, you know, it's a message of, you don't have to worry about learning how to read well. Let me tell you some secrets and you can just figure this out. There's shortcuts. These are, this is, this is someone right. who's almost certainly going to go into tips and tricks that are harmful, not helpful. We do think that reading comp is a test of how well you can read and Therefore, we want you to work on that. It may be challenging yeah. for you. It may take time. It may take right. mental effort, but the long-term be benefits are so exponential, right? Like you're going to get better at reading comp. You're going to get better at logical reasoning. You're also going to get better at games and you're going to get better at what you have to do in law school, what you have to do as an yep. attorney. Like this is what we want you to get good at. Yep. And I feel like this is just going off into some like, Myth, yeah. myth, mythical tangent. This is a turd. I've already updated the scoreboard. Um, this is the type of shit that people say when they want to sell you magic beans, right? Mm. They're, they're telling you, oh, I know it says reading comprehension right at the top. And I know that there's a long passage for you to read. And then a whole bunch of questions that are asking you essentially, what did it say in the passage? Nonetheless, I want to try to make money off of you by giving you the impression that there's a bunch of gimmicks and tips and tricks and stupid strategies. You know, I guarantee that this book is going to then go on to talk about highlighting and underlining and diagramming and note taking and time management and skim the questions before you read the passage and all this nonsense that not only doesn't it help people, but it actually hurts people. You know, <laughs> the, the part that I disagree with the most is their very first sentence, if RC were just a test on how well people read, it would be difficult to improve on it. False. Because I can help you become a better reader. It's a matter of refocusing your attention 
it's it's just that the way you're reading it right now is not good. You need yeah. to read it better. It is you a test to learn of how, how well, to read better, not <laughs> these strategies. Yeah. Right. It, it is a test of how well you can read and we can help you read in that way. It's just a more active form of reading, but it, it has nothing to do with hidden agendas or secret patterns. Wow. It has to do with what does that sentence say? Oh, it's a lot, huh? It's a mouthful, huh? Six or seven lines and there's like four commas in it and it's hard to understand. Yeah, that's the point. Don't get frustrated. Read the first part of it. Just read up until the first comma. How about? Okay, what's that piece mean? Yeah. What's the next piece mean? What's the next piece mean? Can you put it all together? And it's it's not like a special kind of reading. It's just that people like me who are good readers force themselves to take the time to actually understand it. That's the thing that we can teach you. Um, nothing about secret strategies or hidden agendas and secret patterns. Sorry, you were going to say something. No, yeah, I mean, I agree 100%. I was just going to say, and we've said this on the show hundreds of times before, but how many times in class, right, we simply explain what the answer choice was actually saying or what the passage was actually saying. And then people are like, oh, makes sense. There's not some. Yeah, and then the questions <laughs> become incredibly easy to answer. Yeah. Right. Like the questions become predictable mm -hmm. where, and that's another, like it is a strategy that we will teach you, but I don't see how this is a hidden agenda or a secret pattern. It's just, look, when you read the questions on reading comp, right? So you've read the passage, you read the first question. Tell me what the answer is before you look at the answer choices. Oh my God, I can't do that. Okay, well then we need to talk about your reading because you're either not understanding the passage or you're not understanding the question because I can tell you one version of what the right answer is. When I read, what do you think, Ben? I would say over 50% of the questions on reading comp, you can at least answer it in type. In type, what do you mean? Well, I mean, you could say something along the lines of this. Oh, sure, absolutely. I mean, a lot of our predictions are just kind of short um, answers pointing in a direction. Right. Is that what you mean? Yeah. 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 Right. Yeah. So yeah. In typed it, maybe directionally. Yeah. That, mm -hmm. That's probably a better, a better word for that. And because there are, there are some questions where you can't even answer directionally, right? Like a question that says, which one of the following is most supported by the passage above? I don't know. I read well, the passage, but now I, I have I to look at each one. Yeah. I can't, I'm not going to just rehash the entire passage for you. I do know yeah. what the main point of the passage is and that's in my head. I know what the yeah. passage was about. But yeah. this is, you know, probably going to be there's some detail here that one of these was in the passage. And yeah. I don't I can't I can't make any prediction on that. But when it's like, what was the main point of the passage? I've got a prediction for that. What was the primary purpose of the passage? I've got a prediction for that. What was the author's attitude about X, Y, Z? I've got a I've got a prediction for that. Yeah. How would you strengthen this argument that was made in the passage? I've got a prediction for that because I I understood what the passage said. Mm -hmm. maybe it's not a test of how well you read, but it is a test of how well you are reading that passage right now where it's not like, so it's not like a, uh, necessarily just this objective ind independent mess, uh, independent measure where it's like, you can't get better at it because people do get better at it a lot, mm -hmm. but the way they get better at it is by refocusing their attention and just reading it a little more carefully than you probably do by default. Yeah, or what you think reading is, right? How many people come to this test yeah. and have no conception of what they're doing? They're just doing what they've been doing since they were in kindergarten. It's like, oh, well, I'm supposed to, okay, read? Yeah, I got it, this is how I read. And they don't even know what that means. But we're like, wait a sec, slow down, hold on. Think about yep. what you're doing. Do you have a yep. vision in your head of what was just said? No, okay, maybe you're not understanding it. And they never yep. realized that they didn't understand what they were reading. Okay. That was a turd. Scoreboard is 28 pearls, 79 turds, and 26 ties. 
uh, for the history of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Next one is from Anonymous. Subject, better off working in fast food? Question mark. With the upcoming minimum wage raise for fast food workers in California to $20 per hour, we have a link here to an article, I realize that working at McDonald's might be a better career choice than graduating from some law schools. I checked the University of San Francisco on law school transparency, and its median salary for graduates is $51,000. That means that if one works 47 hours a week at a fast food restaurant, 40 hours of regular time plus seven hours of overtime, they would earn the same as the median law graduate at USF. <laughs> I suspect that median law graduate of U the median law graduate of USF is working more than 47 hours a week in their job. Oh, and the tuition plus fees for USF is 54,000 and according to the 509, 32% of students at USF are paying full price. <laughs> okay. That's a shocker in itself that only 32% of the students are paying full price, right? I mean, yeah. that means that 68% of the students at USF, over two thirds of the students at USF are paying something less than full price. And I would encourage everybody to go to lsatdemon.com forward slash scholarships, click into the individual schools, look at our roll call tool, find out more about this open secret that law schools charge everybody a different price and charge almost nobody full price. Hey, I, yeah. sorry, you said this was a shocker. You said 32% of students are paying full price. That's a shocker. I'll tell you a shocker to the shocker. That sounded high to me. Yeah, no, me too. <laughs> Actually, yeah. But I know that for people who don't know the game, they're like, yeah. wait, what? Only 32% of the people even yeah. pay full yeah. price? And it should be a shock. <laughs> it should be a shock. But yeah, we're in like... Um, beyond the looking glass type of thing, right? Where we're, we're just in a real weird world now where they have a nominal fake tuition. Yeah. Um, at USF, it's only 68% fake. And that's actually a, a low number compared yeah. to many other law schools where it'll be like 98% of the school is paying something less than full price. Hmm. Anyway, um, another big shock here Median salary coming out of USF is only $54,000. Holy no, shit. No, 51. And then the tuition and fees is 54. But yeah, oh. the median. <laughs> 51, That's the yeah. median salary coming out of USF law school. You went to USF for three years. You paid something between zero and $54,000 a year to go there for three years. Less living. You probably... Yeah. Plus living expenses, plus fees. Oh, no, yeah. that's including fees. Um, okay. Plus living expenses. You probably didn't work during those three years. You at least definitely didn't work during your 1L year if you're going full time. And you graduate making, yeah, slightly more what minimum wage will be in California. And that means there's people below that. So <laughs> my niece is a junior in high school. She works at McDonald's. She already makes $16 an hour working at McDonald's. Yeah. I mean, yeah, 16 if you work uh, 2000 hours a year, um you're already making uh wait, what is that? 16 times 2000 Thir is 32,000. Yeah. yeah, so like you could make 32,000 without overtime and that's with not working 2 weeks cuz 2000 hours. So you take take 2 weeks off. Yeah, <laughs> you're still making 32 grand people who make this gigantic investment. I mean, again, she's a junior in high school. These are people who went through four years plus of undergrad. Now, plus three years three. of law school. And come out making fifty one thousand dollars. That is terrifying. That is really bad. And, you know, at first there's something I don't know right? McDonald's. You're like, well, I don't want that to be my career. But if you work at McDonald's, you can just start working on your side gig, whatever that is. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that could yeah, be. Any <laughs> anything other than this. I mean, yeah. God damn. That is, uh, that is terrifying. I, I don't know what more to say about it. There, 
<laughs> There's not really a question here. It's just a. Uh, I guess the question's in the subject. Better off working in fast food? Question mark. Oh, I hundred percent think that you are better <laughs> off working in fast food than than going to USF if you're going to make the median salary for graduates from USF. Yeah. Yeah, you need to bring the cost way down. Right. <laughs> Which I guess they're doing via their their crazy scholarship program, right? The the sad part of this, and we complain about it on every show, is the the 32% of the students who are paying full price are just in for a world of hurt because they're there with lower LSAT scores, they're there with lower undergraduate GPAs. They're a very good bet to underperform. Law schools use LSAT and GPA because LSAT and GPA does a good job of predicting how well you're going to do in law school. So these people are, the people who are paying full price have worse scores, worse GPA. They are less likely to be successful in law school. They might not even make the median. That's just the median salary, Ben. That's the median. So they're, pro, they're almost certainly more likely to be below the median. So they're, what, who knows what that is? Because that could be 50,000, but it could be 40. Who knows? If you're considering paying full price for USF, it is a better decision to work at McDonald's. Thanks for writing in. <laughs> in my in my estimation, you agree? Yeah, I agree. I mean, yeah. I would work towards something else. Uh, right. I wouldn't make that my life, but I would. But you could work towards something else much faster because you wouldn't be burdened by all this debt. Yeah, seven years worth of at least seven years worth of education yeah. to get to that point where you make fifty one thousand dollars a year. Or less. <laughs> um, yeah, it's terrifying. Yeah. All right. Next, next question one. is from Michael. The subject is questions for legal professionals. Hello. I recently decided that I wanted to learn more about legal careers and possibly, if free, of course, go to law school. I don't know any lawyers personally, so I've been trying to reach out by email to different legal professionals in the DA office for my county to ask about their experiences. I'm creating a list of questions in the hopes that someone will write me back soon. If you were in my position, what are some important questions you would ask? What do you think, Ben? Uh, already, I think you're, you're creating too much of an ask for whoever you end up emailing. It, it needs to be much shorter. I wouldn't ask them five questions like, oh, tell me this, this and that. I would just send out an email saying, hey, can we talk? And then I guess, sorry, maybe I misunderstood your question. You're just saying once you actually meet them, maybe what are the questions you would ask? But I wouldn't ask them in your email. When you meet them, I would ask them things like, what do you do day to day? How did you get here? Do you like what you do? What would you recommend to someone in my position? Yeah, in the email ask, you need to, you need, I think, we need to back this up a step, right? If they agree to meet with you, then you're on the right track. <laughs> like you're, you're doing well. If they, if they even write you back once you're on the right track. And then at that point, sure. I would ask them questions about themself, mm -hmm. themselves. In, but I, to back it up a step, I mean, we need to talk about how Michael should be doing these cold asks, right? Yeah. I would say, uh, yeah, I'm a student at, Oh, maybe maybe you're still in school. If you're not in school, maybe you say you're thinking about a legal career or going to law school. I think giving you showing that you're you're early in life can actually be an advantage because sure. people might be more inclined to help you out. But keep it short. Say, hey, I I see you do this. I am a student or whatever, and I'd love to talk to you more about your job to see if this is something I might want to pursue. Right. Give them an opportunity to brag about themselves. Everybody loves to talk about themselves. Everybody especially loves to brag about themselves. So I would say step one, learn a little bit about them, Like go to their LinkedIn, you know, maybe you can don't, don't make it look like you've just copy pasted the same email to every single person, put something in the subject, maybe that indicates that like, you know, there's a little something there, like you went to the same undergrad as them. Or, you, or there's, I don't know, just anything that you've learned about them, try to use that as a way to get in and then ask them something that you think they're likely to, to respond enthusiastically to, 
or respond at all to. And then if you do get them on an <clears throat> email conversation, yeah, then ask questions about what it's like to work in that field, you know, but I would always phrase it, like try to keep yourself out of it and instead ask them, you know, how hard was it? Like, did you, how, what did you have to go through to get to where you're at now? Yeah. Are you glad you did it? Is this something that you think other people should do? Yeah. What's the best thing about your job? What are you looking forward to next in your career? Where do you think you're going to go from here? What advice would you give someone in my position? <laughs> yeah, but just don't give them a bunch of heavy handed shit about your position, right? Like yeah. the, the second you start going on with a paragraph or two paragraphs about, oh no, this is important background information. They need to know that I did this internship and that I took this class and I really liked that. It's like, oh my God, they're not reading. No, that. no, 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 absolutely. No, no, it's just like, what would you say to people who are in school right now? Right. right. And people want to give advice. So we do. <laughs> people do want to give advice. Yes. Uh, other thing I would say is pick up the phone. Like mm -hmm. if you can find their phone number, call them, call them during business hours. They, you might catch them at their desk. They might just answer the phone. And if they answer the phone, then you could say, Hey, I'm really sorry to bother you. Um, I saw your profile on, well, what would you say? You'd say something like, uh, I'm really interested in your career. I just wanted to ask you a couple quick questions about, you know, your path and whether you think this is something that, that other people should, should follow. Mm -hmm. How would you do that? Oh, really? That's interesting. Oh, why would you say that? <laughs> you know, like <laughs> yeah. just follow up questions, just keep them talking. Just keep yeah. saying why. Yeah. Or what else? Oh, that's so interesting. Wow. Okay. How what did else, you get other, here? Yeah. Right. How'd you come by that decision? Oh, you did. Oh, cool. Why? Mm -hmm. Why? It's such a great question. Thanks, Michael. Next one is from Grace. The subject is changing to LSAT Demon from another course. Confusion in adopting strategies. Okay. Hi. So I started studying back in October using a popular textbook. I would say my study schedule was mildly relaxed until January. And I started using the demon at the beginning of February. Since I've started using you guys, which has been so helpful, my score went from 152 to 155 range to the 157 to 162 range. Nice. However, it fell this week to 156 and 154 when I started to adopt certain methods, such as reading the passage on logical reasoning before the question and creating worlds for logic games. Should I continue to use what works for me, or is this just something I have to re relearn for it to start working? I am taking the April test with June as a backup. My goal is a 168 plus, and I, re and I really will work however hard it takes to get there. What should I do? Yeah. Thank you, Grace, for writing in. Um, in this case, you should not continue to use what works for you because it doesn't actually work for you. You're still in the 157 to 162 range. That's not where you want to end up. You want to end up at a much higher range, right? Well, then follow our advice. It is like <laughs> you, you will find logical reasoning much easier if you start attacking the argument instead of wasting time reading the question first and getting all caught up in theory and strategies about that are question type specific, it's so much more confusing if you do it that way. Instead, learn how to attack the argument, attack the passage, figure out what's there. You'll start answering the questions before you've ever even read the entire passage, let alone the question, let alone the answer choices. I mean, it's just like this amazing shortcut when you learn how to attack the passages on LR, on games, it's another incredible shortcut. Like you might grind through games, brute forcing it, however you're currently doing it. If you're not using worlds, you're basically brute forcing it. And yeah, I, uh, you know, I know you can answer some games that way. So can I. But I'm going to finish the entire section in anywhere between 20 and 30 minutes. And if you want to get to 168 or 170, whatever, you're going to need to be able to do all four games in time. So 
right now you're brute forcing, it's not working. The second you start applying our different strategies, well, yeah, you might slow down a little bit at first. Uh, we've given you some new tools. You don't know how to use those tools yet. So a couple points decline in your practice test scores is not surprising at all. I think that that will persist for a week or two. And then <laughs> from there, you are going to skyrocket because you're going to start to see how easy the test actually can be. I would just add one small thing, and that is I would shift your focus from LSAT scores, although ultimately yeah. um, you want to you know, get a higher score, to accuracy. Uh, the demon does that. It tells you what percentage you got right of the ones you actually attempted. That's a much more important metric for gauging your future success than just your raw score. Than just scores, yeah. Like eventually scores are going to be what matters, but accuracy is how you're going to get there. And so, yeah, focusing on your accuracy on questions attempted, that's probably the big one that's really going to make uh, really going to make your scores go up in the long run is that you just focus on getting the questions right, getting the games right. Mm -hmm. And uh, I do think that reading the passage first, not the question, and doing worlds on the games, both of those things are going to lead to um, big growth in your future if you stick with it. Just learn how to do those strategies. I think you'll be in great shape. All right. The last is uh, tips from a departing demon. Uh, the departing demon this time is Nick. A few things. Firstly, don't tell everyone you know that you are taking the LSAT. I love that tip. Nick says, this can introduce external stressors because of expectations from the folks that you might tell. Everyone's law school application process is unique, and the only expectations that you should have are the ones that you set for yourself. God, I love that so much. You know, your mom, your dad, your friends, your friends in law school, they're going to be pushing you to rush this process. They, they want the best for you, but they don't know what is best for you. They're going to force you. They're going to be like, no, just register. Just sign up. You'll be ready. You'll be ready by then. Just sign up. Oh, you don't. Oh, you're, you're, yeah, you're taking the test tomorrow, but you're not happy with your practice test. Well, just go take the test anyway. Just, just go take it. Just see how you do. And they're just going to give you all kinds of shitty advice. Yeah. I mean, that's, I love it too, because I think you're right. The vast majority of people you're talking to have the best, your best interest in their you know, in their minds and they're trying to help you. They just don't know how to help you. But you also do have those people who want to bring you down. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you yeah. Know, you're, you're going to law school. Like, come on, man. That's not what we do. Yeah. We do something else. For it. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. I Especially mean, depending on what kind of shitty small town you live in and what kind of, you know, like people who haven't gone anywhere with their life and aren't going anywhere with their life. Mm hmm. Yeah, people do do a lot of undermining. I didn't think about that. Let's go. Secondly, says Nick. Again, this is Nick. He's he's a departing demon. He studied with the demon. He's happy. He's leaving and he's giving some parting wisdom on his way out the door. So first tip was great from Nick. Uh, second, don't make the LSAT the main focus of your life. While the LSAT demands attention, having no life outside of your LSAT studying is not only unsustainable in the long run, but it is also counterproductive insofar as making consistent progress on the LSAT. Two pearls. Two pearls from Nick. Yeah, I, I do love that. How, how much of a focus in people's lives do we really want it to be? Is there a level of maximum focus? Yeah, I think once you start hitting like more than three hours a day, you really have to question whether that's going to be useful. I know some people can do it, but that seems like too much. Yeah, I, I don't think I have ever once advised someone to take a month off of work or to quit their job to study for the LSAT. I mean, I think you should quit your job for a million other reasons, but I don't think you should quit your job to to study for the LSAT. Yeah. Um, I, 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 the number that popped into my head was 15 hours a week. Mm. I also think you can productively make progress on the LSAT with just one hour a day. If you give me one high quality focused hour every day, I think you're doing great. If you can bump that up to 15 hours a week, I think you're doing probably even better. 
And then at some point, man, you start to get this diminishing returns where yeah, you might be getting then, some return. And then, then negative returns, right? Yeah. Negative returns after a certain point, right? Yeah. yeah. The, the guy who's doing a test every single day and not really reviewing it and just, you know, getting pissed because his scores aren't going up. I'm working yeah. so hard at this. I'm working 40 hours a week on this. I'm full time, you know, I quit my job for this. And then they're just like, the stress is just building and building. And that is where you get to the negative returns point of the curve. So yeah, I would say have a job. Uh, do stuff with your friends and family, get some exercise. If you can make sleep the primary focus, <laughs> like make sleep the first thing in your day, like yeah. LeBron James, instead of the last thing in your day, mm. right? Like set that window for sleep, give yourself a full opportunity to get the amount of sleep that you need to focus, to, to be your best. Yep. Um, and do that every single day. Uh, and then, yeah, give, give me one really good hour every day. And if you can give me more than that, great. But <laughs> I'm just not asking anybody for 40 hours a week. That was awesome, Nick. Thanks for that. Uh, thanks for those tips. Word of the week time. The first one is from me. The sentence is several speakers invade against the proposed casino. I know what that word. Well, I've seen that word before. I'm familiar with that word. Okay. Um, you can also get it from context here because the very next word is against. Yeah. So several speakers invade against the proposed casino. Uh, LSAT demon teacher Ala likes to do uh, the. She just replaces words that she doesn't know with something. Mm -hmm. So I don't know if she invented that tip or if somebody else invented that tip, but I, I heard it from her. Several speakers, something against the proposed casino yeah well what could they be doing what yeah. what kinds of things could could fill that gap if they are they are speakers who are yeah. <laughs> something against the proposed casino hmm. i would guess that they're probably speaking yeah they're probably talking and in they and by the way this is spelled i-n-v-e-i-g-h-e-d invade um, there are two definitions. One is to complain bitterly. Hmm. The second is to speak against in an impassioned manner. Um, they're trying to put a, uh, casino about 15 minutes from where I live. Gross. <laughs> and people are obviously, uh, speaking against that. And this was, I was reading the local newspaper and this is the word that popped out at me. I've never seen this word used in this way. So. That's one of the grossest things that you could possibly have near you. I mean, it's yeah. just so sad and it's just, <laughs> just so bad for everybody, but the casino and yep. you know, they, they're going to sell it in terms of, well, tax, tax revenue. Yeah, and, you know, exactly. Yeah. But man, it is, that is a gambling is a terrible addiction. It ruins people's lives. It ruins, destroys families. Uh, and it's just sad <laughs> to walk through a casino <laughs> So I'm not surprised that you've got speakers invading against that in your uh, lovely neighborhood, Ben. Mm. I looked up uh, the word kibosh. I, when I hear that word, the, the first thing that comes to my mind is we put the kibosh on that. Like we said no to that. Is that how this is used or how did you find it? Yeah, no, that's exactly what it is. Um, I looked it up. This is interesting because I didn't put the Kindle definition on here. Um, Eric helpfully provided us with the Merriam Webster definition. And yeah, the example is well, the definition is something that serves as a check or stop, hmm. usually used in the phrase put the kibosh on. Hmm. And uh, the interesting thing was, oh, I remember why I wanted it to be on uh, word of the week now is that the etymology of that word is completely unclear. Like nobody knows where it comes from. Mm. Yeah. It sounds to me a little bit like Yiddish. Yeah. That's what but, I was thinking too. <laughs> and, and, but, and there have been like, people have rumors, you know, like rumors that it's, that it has like Yiddish etymology, but nobody can find that. So it's just like, no one really knows where this came from. It's just this weird word. Um, and is it kibosh or kibosh? I think it might be both. 
Kibosh. I've always heard it as kibosh, but kibosh. who knows? Oh, wow. Kibosh. Actually, kibosh. so Miriam Webster is saying kai in both okay. of their, uh, both of their. Kibosh. Uh, kibosh. Yeah. So they're unclear about where the accent goes on the first or second syllable, <laughs> but uh, it, it's, uh, kibosh. they're saying kibosh. Yeah. Okay. And is I, that how I, you I, say it? I would have said, put the kibosh. Yeah. You're going to put the kibosh on that. <laughs> if yeah. You're going to shut something down. Yeah. All right. Anyway, be LSAT famous. Please ask questions or share news with us on our website, thinkinglsat.com, or find us on socials at LSAT Demon. If you have questions about the LSAT Demon, you can email help at LSATdemon.com. Check out our other podcast, LSAT Demon Daily. That was episode 445 of the Thinking LSAT podcast. Thanks, all y'all, for listening. Nice knowing you. Don't pay for law school. <laughs>